been Palo Alto, California. I've been an entrepreneur for about 13 years now. Uh, my partners have been entrepreneurs for even longer than me. That makes them older than me. Um, Eyal here, who you guys have met, is one of the uh, pioneers of the early consumer internet. Um, founded a social network in 1998 and a video sharing site uh, just before YouTube. Um, UD, our CTO, has been with us for four companies now. Um, and Guy as well. These are my uh, bio brothers and other brothers. Um, I'm going to walk us through uh, very quickly some stuff that's pretty intuitive to us all, if not from before, then definitely from this weekend, um, and why we got so excited about blockchain and about bringing local currencies to the blockchain. Um, so blockchain 1.0 uh, really mimics internet 1.0 allowed us to share information instantly, freely, from anywhere. Um, as Michael said yesterday, information is, uh, is unique in that when you share it, you both now have it. If I send you an email, I've got it, you've got it. Um, the value stored in money is quite different, right? When I give it to you, I no longer have it, you have it. Um, and this is why we haven't seen true money transfer on the public internet until blockchain. It was very hard to secure uh, these types of transactions and ensure that money couldn't be duplicated, deleted, uh, or changed. Bitcoin, essentially, we saw as the first killer app of blockchain. Um, and for us, consumer internet people, where there's a first killer app, uh, there are many other apps that follow. And so we essentially started thinking about the long tail of user-generated currencies and, and what would come next after Bitcoin. Intellectually, of course, Bitcoin fascinated us as the first non-governmental money that was reaching any kind of critical mass. Um, philosophically, this is a big shift for humans uh, that we haven't, we haven't seen until now. Um, so Internet 1.0 really brought offline models online. If you guys remember, you know, pets.com and all that good stuff. Um, Internet 2.0 actually created new types of models, right, where the content is adaptive, let's say, to the user input. Um, we call this user-generated everything, so content recommendations, all the apps we know and love. Um, and the theory of the long tail is that 99% or let's say 100x of the value is actually created in the long tail, um, not just in the hits. So again, when we saw the hit of Bitcoin, a $20 billion and growing hit, uh, we started thinking about what would be the 100x value after Bitcoin that would come from the user-generated currency space. Um, blockchain at the time, this was about four years ago, wasn't mature enough for us to use uh, for consumer applications and certainly wasn't mature enough for uh, consumers to use. And so we started building kind of isolated currencies, not on blockchain, um, out of Israel where we were working in our previous company. Uh, what you're seeing here is actually screenshots of one of our most popular currencies called Lev Market. Lev is the word for heart in Hebrew, so this is the heart market. Um, and this was a currency specifically for mothers. Uh, mothers use this currency to trade every kind of good and service you can imagine between them, from babysitting to strollers to toys. They would get together in these amazing offline events. Uh, we ran this project for about two years. Uh, about 20,000 Israeli mothers participated. At its peak, we saw 1,000 transactions per day among mothers, and over the course of the pilot, saw over $20 million worth of commerce in hearts between mothers without one shekel or one dollar ever changing hands. Um, and the real aha moment for us was when these mothers uh, would come by our office nearly in tears, uh, thanking us for this tool and this product, and they would tell us things like, you know, before I had hearts, I didn't have enough money for any of the, any of the things that I want my children to have. Toys, after school activities, good care. Um, all my shekels were accounted for to pay rent, to pay gas, to pay taxes, to pay insurance. Um, and I had nothing left over for kind of the luxuries of life, like toys for my children. Um, so for us, this was, a, this was a real shift in thinking about money, what money is. Uh, this tool for human collaboration um, and how we could get more of it into more hands. So these currencies and, and Mothers was one pilot that we ran, but we did similar projects with students, we did similar projects with 
uh, we call them vegans, but they're kind of a, you know, a sustainability crowd, um, a fashion crowd. We had many pilots and, and we saw the same success and then the same plateau in all of these pilots. And over the years we realized that, and there are also many local currencies around the world beyond the ones that we were working on, we realized that there were two kind of gating limitations to local currencies really taking off. The first was that because these currencies weren't connected to the traditional economy, um, businesses and uh, those with access to capital couldn't really participate. They couldn't cover their overhead costs. They couldn't play in these systems if they couldn't cash out, essentially, the hearts, let's say, uh, for regular money. Uh, and the other big problem is that even these uh, alternative currencies, let's call them, or local currencies, weren't connected to each other. So even if you did get a critical mass of communities using these tools, they couldn't trade between them. Um, and as we know from economics, if your country or your economy isn't a full stack economy with everything that your members might need, you're gonna have to import from outside of your economy. And in order to import, your currency is gonna have to be accepted by someone else. And this is where we ran into the problem time and time again, which is how do you create exchange rates for a heart? What's a heart worth? To the mothers, it's worth a lot. It's worth a stroller. It's worth babysitting. It's worth toys that they can't afford. But it was very hard, not only for the currency governors, but for the users themselves to appreciate these exchange rates between new currencies. So blockchain 2.0 comes along, and we've heard, uh, you know, now we see the rise of programmable currencies. We've heard a lot about MasterCoin. Uh, a little known fact, we actually incubated MasterCoin in our office in Tel Aviv. Um, we helped them with their first hackathon. We were incredibly inspired by what they were doing because it was the inkling to us of what was to come and solutions to these problems we were experiencing on the consumer side of things. As we've also heard, MasterCoin was some of the inspiration behind Ethereum. And Ethereum really brings us to this new generation of smart contract environments and a, uh, an alt cur currency with a critical mass that allows it to connect to the traditional economy. So now, in the, and this I think is why there's so much excitement for developers around Ethereum, because you can build apps and ecosystems around Ethereum that have a back channel to the original economy via the Ethereum price. This led us to develop a protocol that we're calling Bancor. Bancor enables autonomous price discovery and liquidity for crypto tokens. Essentially, Bancor allows tokens to hold other tokens, one or multiple, in their reserve. I won't get too much into the technicalities of it, but our white paper is available on our website. It's bancor.network, um, and Ayal and myself are here uh, to answer any specific questions that you have. But fundamentally what this means is that crypto tokens can be exchanged automatically. You don't need someone on the other side to buy them from you in order to exchange them uh, for whatever their, their price is being discovered through the network. This is extremely important for small cap currencies. So if you think about a local currency, there isn't fundamentally a good reason for the uh, entire global co economy to want to buy these local currencies. The local currency is meant to function well inside of the community. Um, and so this kind of, this gating uh, principle where you need your currency to be either widely adopted, very well known, or high volume of trade in order for it to be listed on exchanges and exchangeable with other currencies is really counterintuitive to what a local currency is meant to do, which is uh, create trade and collaboration within a specific group of people. Uh, the protocol is inspired by a, a Keynesian proposal called Bancor. He suggested this at uh, the Bretton Woods conference at the end of World War II. Um, he basically said, you know, guys, we could, we could really benefit from a supranational currency that all countries essentially trade against when we trade international currencies. Just like money allows us to move forward from barter, this supranational currency uh, actually allows international money to trade more efficiently. We all know how the story went from there. The US said thanks, but no thanks. We're gonna use the US dollar as the international reserve currency. And don't worry, it's backed by gold. So there's not really a lot of counterparty risk here. Fast forward 30 years later, we're no longer backed by gold and we have a uh, completely fiat currency as our international reserve currency. Um, so we owe a lot of inspiration to the, bank, the original Bancor proposal. 
Um, so what are we building? The protocol, like I mentioned, the Bancorp protocol, uh, more details on that are in the white paper, including all of the formulas, um, as well as the smart contract. So it's already live and you can check it out online if you want to look at the source code on your phone. It's, uh, it's up there and available. Um, and another thing that we're building are the web and mobile apps, which essentially will allow consumers to create new tokens or use tokens that have been created for their communities. Um, some cool new features that are enabled these days, like AI assistance, what we call bots, which uh, are basically a function of everything we learned over the past many years, how you even coach someone through the process of creating their own token, right? It's not, it's not as simple as creating a website, and yet we're aiming here to be the Wix of tokens. If you guys are familiar with Wix, they allow anyone who is even non-technical to create a pretty rich and fully developed website. So just a, a touchstone here of what the apps look like, and I'd actually, we'll cut to a short video. So if Brock said that uh, white papers are not enough, and um, Yanni said that smart contracts maybe are not enough, we've actually built a lot of this product, and what you're seeing here is um, a video of the live product uh, itself. So I'll just kind of walk you through it. So these are a variety of communities with tokens that you might either be a part of or discover through the system. Every token, is, as you're familiar with from social networks and other, uh, other sites, has got a location, some information, an admin that you can get in touch with, some about information, of course an icon and a cover photo. Um, you can dig more deeply into the token's history, how it's been traded, uh, when it was launched, how it was funded, uh, who's holding it who's administering it, the timeline of the token. You can check out the members of your currency, who's using it, who's in your group. You can follow them, you can buy from them. You can look at discussions. This is where you might see things like events. Of course, your profile which brings you into your wallet, merchants that you might be following, tokens that you might be following, your wallet address, of course, for all your commerce, your transaction history, and worth mentioning again that this is actually the live product. Um, so very easy to create either a new member, a new profile, a new token, or a new merchant, which is essentially a storefront. Here you're walking a little bit through the bot creation process, so very easy questions. Supply your token name. What's your about text? What should the symbol be for your coin? What's the singular name of your coin and the plural name of your coin? Um, so very, very simple setup uh, for a very uh, mainstream consumer. All of this is integrated into the messaging apps that we find the most relevant today, but of course uh, will stay current with the ecosystem development in terms of where the users are and how they like to use these social products. And at the end of this process, which kind of feels like you're filling out a form almost, you've actually created a, a fully functional cryptocurrency um, it's an ERC-20 at the moment, but as Ayal and some of the other folks on the panel were talking about later, this is truly a cross-blockchain solution. So naturally, if we had a currency here for uh, the Coin Agenda conference, uh, we'd be seeing some pretty interesting trades happening, maybe last night, maybe tonight. Great, so that's the demo. Um, and if anyone wants to dig deeper into the product, both Ayal and I can uh, give you a, a more comprehensive walkthrough. Yes, I, I will take questions. Um, let's just get to the end here. What kind of tokens can you create um, on the local coin platform? Local currencies are what we're really passionate about because we see them creating massive impact for regular people. This is what we're extremely excited about. Um, but loyalty programs, crowdfunding, microfinancing, ETFs are essentially 100% backed bank or token. So you can imagine a token that is backed by 50% USD and 50% BTC or really anything else. 
functions much like an ETF. Um, ICOs, Royale's doing a lot of innovative thinking around how to coach token creators through the ICO definition process. What actually is the value proposition of your currency? How do you see it playing out over time? What do your users need to know in order to understand the value of your community coin? And of course, future innovation. I've heard things here this weekend, and we all hear these, um, these new models coming up. A coin that represents the future harvest of a square footage of plants. A coin that represents a watt of energy um, in a specific facility. So the idea here really is to open up the long tail and allow innovation to come uh, from the crowd. So the vision of local coin really is a world with even millions of currencies uh, that function very well locally but are tradable globally through an interconnected value network. Uh, this fulfills the promise of blockchain, of helping us shift society from a pyramid-like structure, maybe a few pyramids with limited room at the tops, to a network with more access to opportunity. Great, thanks.